All righty. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. We are going to uh, have an interesting conversation today. We will be talking about, about the current crisis in Ukraine. Um, it's all over the news, so I guess most of you have noticed it. Um, and to begin with, uh, we will be joined with uh, doc, uh, Dr. Grigory Mesejnikov. He will be our presenter and he will essentially help us better understand the problem. So I will first introduce uh, Dr. Mesejnikov to you so that you have some sort of um, uh, background. And uh, then uh, he will uh, uh, talk to us about uh, the current crisis and essentially inform us about things that we may not be able to see in, uh, in news because he is right there. And then we can essentially engage with him and ask him questions and, um, and sort of understand the problem or the issue a little bit better. And then understand also what type of policies our government may be doing to um, <clears throat> to uh, address the problem. So uh, Dr. Grigory Mesejnikov uh, is the resident scholar and previous president of the Institute for Public Affairs in Bratislava in Slovakia. And this is a member of European Union and a member of NATO. He obtained his PhD in political science from Faculty of Arts at Moscow State University in Russia. So he's well, well versed in Russian politics as well. He previously worked at the Com Comnius University in Bratislava and at the Cabinet of Political Science of the Slovak Academy of Sciences. He also worked at the Department of Political Science of the National Taiwan University in Taipei in Taiwan. He was a visiting expert at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, Austria as a part of Europe, Europe's Future Program. He was also a research fellow in Sweden and in the United States and in 2006, he graduated from Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellow Program at the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, DC. Dr. Mesejnikov was the editor and author of several dozen of books, including global reports on the state of society in Slovakia and the chief author of the chapter on Slovakia for Nations in Transit reports published by the Freedom House. He has published expert studies in journals all over the world. He specializes in issues of party systems development and party politics, as well as the issues of the democratic transitions in Central and Eastern European countries. In 2015, Dr. Mesejnikov co-authored the book, Diverging Voices, Converging Policies, the Visegrad State's reaction to the Russia-Ukrainian conflict. So he's well-versed in Ukrainian crisis um, and history that led to the current situation as well as the regional dynamics and potential consequences of the conflict if it develops any further. He was uh, kind enough uh, to respond to my call to join us here at Brow College in South Florida for today's discussion from Bratislava in Slovakia and shed more lights on the situation in and around Ukraine, and perhaps also tells us, tell us why and how this current uh, uh, crisis is relevant for us in the United States. So Dr. Mesejniko, please take over. Thank you very much, Mirsad, for this introduction. Just a very small correction. I'm still the president of the Institute for Pub Public Affairs, not former, but current. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's very small detail. Thank you very much, first of all, my uh, dear friend Mirsad, for invitation. Uh, why I was invited? Uh, I am, as uh, Mirsad said, I am a political scientist dealing with the issues of party system development, electoral studies, party politics in Slovakia and Central Europe, political framework of the transformation. But since 2014, somehow the focus of my research and essayistic activities was broadened because. Uh, the issue of external threats became relevant for the whole Central Europe after one of the big countries invaded another country. And this country which was invaded is our biggest 
uh, neighbor, the biggest neighbor of Slovakia. So I have uh, one advantage which uh, helped me maybe to do this job because as Mirsad mentioned in his introduction, I was born I was born in Russia, so 40, more than 40 years ago, I came to Czechoslovakia. Since that time, I'm here, I'm working for different institutions, and but not living in Russia, still I am present inside Russia as a, as a consumer of the discourse. I'm not, of course, a creator of discourse inside Russia. I'm co I'm contributor to discourse in Slovakia about domestic politics, some aspects of foreign policy, and I'm using my knowledge of language and knowledge of uh, environment in Russia, in Ukraine, by the way, two, uh, uh, two wings of my family, one originated from Ukraine and another from Russia. So somehow I felt myself uh, enough qualified at least to explain people in Slovakia some peculiarities of the situation in both these countries. And as I said, since 2014, after Russia invaded Ukraine and annexed the part of its territory and de facto is conducting war against Ukraine, many contexts are very important for us as a member of the EU, European Union, member of NATO, as a country which really uh, is neighboring country to Ukraine and what is happening in Ukraine it's very important for us. Now just let me uh, to uh, to say a few words about these two countries, how they're important for Slovakia. First, Ukraine. Ukraine, as I said, is our neighboring countries and since uh, Ukraine became independent state, it it happened in 1992. That time Slovakia was still part of the of Czechoslovakia, but uh, became independent republic in 1993. Relations between Slovakia and Ukraine was really very good. I would say even excellent, regardless of of the composition of the ruling elite in Ukraine. Either it was President Kravchuk or two times President uh, Kuchma or then President Yushchenko. Uh, Yanukovych even, uh, Yanukovych, Poroshenko, and now Zelensky, with all the Ukrainian administrations, Slovakia uh, had excellent relations with Ukraine. Ukraine didn't pretend to any part of our territory. It's very friendly uh, nation, very friendly people. Ukraine uh, expressed sympathies to our efforts to be part of the of European community, even membership in NATO. So Ukraine was more or less supportive, not creating any obstacles for this process. I think that it was very realistic uh, estimation of the situation if our neighbor Slovakia will be part of European Union and NATO, it will be more stable, more prosperous, more democratic country with which we can keep good relations. So it was position of Ukraine as an independent state. Now, Slo Slovakia's relations with Russia. Russia, after collapse of communism, and after, uh, I would say, self-destruction of the self-collapse of Soviet Union, also became independent state, but with different perception of what was happening at that time in Central Europe. Yes, during a very short period of time, Russia, under the leadership of Boris Yeltsin, declared its peaceful and democratic uh, intentions. Uh, behaving more or less friendly to Central European countries, which were de facto Czechoslovakia was even occupied by Soviet troops in uh, 1968. So it was a part of the socialist bloc. Socialist bloc under the uh, leadership of Soviet Union and Boris Yeltsin administration declared that time, time change and now we will be different state and our relations as a former hegemon power with uh, our former kind of vassals will be normal on an equal base. So it was a declaration, but reality, even during uh, Boris Yeltsin's uh, administration was a bit different. Russia didn't support our uh, movement in direction of NATO. Russia did at that time everything to prevent this, not only Slovakia's membership, but also membership of other countries. So Russia wasn't very enthusiastic concerning our membership in the European Union. So that time Russia were, uh, was more or less 
observing what was happening because it wasn't enough strong to really prevent this development. But the uh, behavior of Russia sent us signals that, uh, I mean, what really the best would happen to our countries, including Slovakia, was that we became a part of the community of democratic states. So European Union and NATO. And, and now, years and years after this, Slovakia became a member of European Union and NATO in 2004. And three of four countries, Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary, even five years before. But now we see how important it was that our political elite did this decision. So to be part of the community of developed Western democracies in, in Europe. So, and uh, having in mind this very short uh, characterization of uh, the difference between relations between uh, Ukraine to Slovakia and Russia to Slovakia, and more importantly, Ukraine uh, itself decided to be part of this community. Probably it will be a longer way, but it's a part of official Ukraine state doctrine today that its ultimate goal of Ukrainian, not only foreign policy, because membership in the European Union, it's not only about foreign policy, it's about internal reorganization of society, reforms, democratization, and so on. And for us, it, it has strategic importance that not only our Southern, Western, and, and Northern uh, neighbors are the part of the same organization as we are members, but also Ukraine. Now, in 2014, as I said, something substantial happened uh, in the eastern part, southern and eastern part of Ukraine. As I said, after the collapse of the communism, these two countries uh, started their new stage of political history, but in very different manner. In Ukraine, even we, uh, taking into consideration that uh, uh, the oligarchic elements were quite visible in, uh, and kleptocratic elements were very visible in political development. There were some very toxic groups of interest, but nevertheless, Ukraine from the beginning started to develop itself as a democratic country, as a pluralist society. Even today, Ukraine is not perfect democracy, not speaking about situation 30 years ago, but from the beginning, it was absolutely clear that uh, uh, the political elites which govern Ukraine, with all these differences, ideological value, uh, that they decided to uh, rule the country with democratic methods, in perfect democracy, but still during the whole period of time since Ukraine, Ukrainian independence, maybe with very short, a couple of weeks, situation in January uh, 2014. 14. I, I can tell about this later a bit, but Ukraine was democratic country, democratic country which is peaceful toward the, to the neighbors and, try, and uh, even, even with this oligarchic government of Yanukovych, still it was a functional parliament, there were political parties quite viable political parties, it was the opposition. So it was, as I said, imperfect, but democracy. And people felt and still feel themselves free. Russia, after uh, the collapse of Soviet Union, as I said, short period of time, seven, eight years, developed as a country which tried to be democratic society, but immediately two, three years ago, after the collapse of uh, Soviet Union, uh, Yeltsin's administration somehow taken the steps which at the end led to uh, emergence of very centralized, hierarchic and non-democratic model of political development. So very strong competences of the president, that time it was Yeltsin, who was some, uh, of course, uh, the politician with the internal feeling of freedom, liberty, and democracy, but of course in very specific manner. But uh, the structure of Russian uh, political system, even that time, was quite over-centralized, over-hierarchized, over and with strong competences of the president. So it was that time even clear that it's too risky 
to have this system and many depended even that time uh, on uh, from from the personal characteristics of the leader and then what happened in uh, 1999 when boris yeltsin announced that uh, he is uh, he is leading the position of president and he is proposing and de facto he nominated and de facto not of course in legal uh, manner but de facto he nominated his successor vladimir putin and then i think i think that since that time uh russia became to develop non in democratic manner uh and maybe the first let's say seven eight years it wasn't uh, absolutely clear it wasn't clear that russia is moving in this direction however they were experts, they were scholars, they were politicians themselves who were observing the situation from inside that something wrong is happening in Russian state. And of course, uh, Chechen wars, which started, by the way, during, uh, during uh, Yeltsin's administration, problems with neighbors, the former member of the Soviet Union, uh installation of military troops in moldova some border conflicts with uh, with ukraine so something which indicated the time that russia is not moving in direction of creation of national democratic state with the civic principles with plurality with peaceful intention toward uh, neighbors and with willingness to be part of the broader community of democratic states and i think that the crucial point which indicated showed really that russia is oh, not russia the kremlin so the russian leadership is thinking about another type of organization of society and especially which is very important for our talk today about the model of relations between russia and outer world between russia and the west between Russia and the former uh, republics of Soviet Union and Russia and former states which belong to the Soviet bloc. In 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. I think that it was a test. It was a test first, how, what Russia can do if it wanted to uh, somehow use its position toward the uh, weaker neighbors. And we know that this, and the second test was how the West will be react to this. Whether uh, the West will tolerate this, accept this, how it will treat. And I think that it was, frankly speaking, badly done test by the West. And it uh, encouraged Kremlin for continuation of this policies towards the neighboring countries. Uh, here maybe I uh, just for a few seconds mention uh, famous uh, President Putin's speech in Munich uh, conference about security in which he de facto accused the West that West is not accepting Russia as an equal partner and demonstrated uh, completely I would say non-consensual uh, approach to relations with uh, other countries, and unfortunately, I think that the test. But it, I think it was even pretest because uh, invasion to Georgia took place in in August. But a couple of months before, Vladimir Putin was invited to the Bucharest summit of NATO states, and in this summit, he shocked the participants, leaders of. 87 countries at that time when he said that you cannot accept Ukraine into NATO because Ukraine is not even the state. So completely shocked leaders, by the way, they didn't really consider that time application of Ukraine or Ukrainian um, uh, interest to be member of NATO. However, I think that at least uh, NATO at that time could uh, give U Ukraine this membership action plan, which is the first step for the process of gradual integration into uh, military structures of this alliance. But uh, nevertheless, even shocked 
uh, by Vladimir Putin, the leaders of NATO states that time uh, included into the final declaration of, of the summit one small sentence that the door for other countries who are interested to be members of NATO, including Ukraine and Georgia, so this door can be will be open. It's, it was very, I mean, very unclear, nothing about the schedule of this, when it would happen, what, what are modalities and so on. So since that time, Vladimir Putin, after the West, I think, didn't react enough efficiently to the aggression against Georgia, and after this, Russia de facto uh, cut big part of the territory of Georgia, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia was declared as an independent state. We know that it's mockery independence. It, it's uh, just uh, the Russian controlled territory, both Abkhazia and especially South Ossetia. And of course, uh, the world didn't recognize this, but, uh, but for uh, Putin, it was a signal that uh, after a couple of maybe weeks and maybe two, three months uh, of the criticism from the West uh, to, uh, to uh, Russian behavior, Russian aggression, West somehow returned uh, in its relationship with Russia uh, as bi to business as usual. So nothing happened, no, no sanctions, just uh, temporarily some programs in cooperation between EU and, and, and Russia. Uh, these programs were temporarily postponed, not even canceled. So it means that uh, de facto Vladimir Putin got what he wanted to, uh, to get. So uh, then uh, in Ukraine, there were quite encouraging development, which uh, was very different from development in Russia. So in Russia, Vladimir Putin gradually concentrated its power. Uh, in Ukraine, however, there were replacement of the governments, replacement of the presidents. So uh, Ukraine was functioning as a, as a democratic state with all problems, again, with all problems, with certain institutional instability, with, uh, of course, uh, corrupt practices, some violations of, uh, let's say, selected politicians, their, their rights. I can mention uh, Yulia Timoshenko, who was prisoner during Yanukovych's regime. So Yanukovych was uh, elected as a president uh, who uh, supported good relations with Russia, but at the same time, formally, still formally, somehow abided this line to uh, inclusion of Ukraine into European integration. So during uh, Yanukovych's time, really democracy was even less perfect in Ukraine. But again, opposition was a legitimate part of the parliament. Several opposition parties of different orientation were elected in the parliament. Elections were more or less free. And at the same time in Russia, it was a process of concentration of powers, competences, and consolidation of authoritarian practices of the regime. So uh, in, in the meantime, uh, Ukraine started the process of pre-accession to European Union. So Ukraine is part of the special program of European Union with uh, Eastern European countries. Eastern partnership, Ukraine together with Moldova, Georgia, uh, Armenia, Belarus wasn't official part of this, and Azerbaijan also had a spe special status, but Ukraine was very advancing in this process. And at the end of 2013, President Yanukovych should go to Vilnius in the summit of uh, European Union with uh, uh, members of this East Eastern Partnership program to sign, to sign the uh, association agreement. It was unbelievable achievement of Ukraine, if it would happen that time. Unbelievable, because it was uh, the first time when the post-Soviet Republic showed its abilities first to implement reforms, to, to fulfill its obligations, and really to improve the situation of the country. It wasn't, of course, the process of integration into European Union itself. 
but it was the pre-accession very important step which had symbolic significance and practical importance. And at the end, Yanukovych went to Vilnius, but didn't do this. He didn't uh, sign the association agreement. Why? Because uh, he had before meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin and Vladimir Putin, there were some uh, evidences, some testimonies of people who were either on this meeting or very close to Yanukovych's administration at that time. So Vladimir Putin de facto didn't allow uh, Yanukovych to do this. So he used many, I would say, methods how to persuade Yanukovych not to do this. And at the end, Yanukovych didn't do this. And it was for Ukrainian public, especially the more advanced part, part, part of Ukrainian public, it was very frustrating. So young people, students, uh, intellectuals, uh, people living in different parts of Ukraine, not only in, in uh, the West Ukraine, but also in Eastern part. I, I have to say that du uh, during the previous maybe 15 years, I, I was visiting Ukraine quite frequently, de facto all regions, uh, Western, Southern, Eastern Ukraine, and of course, the proportion between very committed uh, supporters of, U of European way of Ukra Ukraine and the opponents was different in different regions, but nevertheless, society somehow, big part of society accepted this. I mean, this uh, officially, uh, officially declared intention about European way of Ukraine. And what happened? Young people came to the streets in Kiev and they, they were uh, demonstrating peacefully. They were demonstrating peacefully, but something happened uh, at the second uh, end of December in 2013, and police brutally was brut brutally beaten. Students dispersed uh, the student, and it was so spectacular event, which very disturbing, very disturbing. With uh, fortunately, at that time uh, uh, nobody was killed. But there were injuries, and the brutality was shocking, absolutely shocking for population in Kiev, but not only in Kiev, in other in other cities. And since that time, we can uh, speak about uh, phenomenon of so-called Euro Euro Maidan. Maidan is a special term. First, it's the uh, name of the big square in uh, the downtown of Kiev, Maidan Nezależnosti. So it's uh, like a square of independence, but also Maidan is a special kind of, I would say, speaking by by academic language, it's a place of public deliberations. So it's a place in which citizens, inhabitants are gathering and they are deciding, they are discussing and deciding about important issues of public life, political issues and so on. It was somehow inherited from Ukrainian past. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have enough time to speak about relations between Ukraine and Russia in centuries. Maybe if there will be some questions I can answer, but now I'm more focused on, on the contemporary discourse and the current development. So, and people started to gather on this uh, Maidan Square in Kiev. And the numbers of, of participants was rising and rising, rising and rising. There were thousands, uh, dozens of, uh, dozens of uh, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, people were coming from other cities. So it lasted, it lasted uh, more than a year, uh, more than a month and a half. And in January, and it was a trigger for even more active participation of people in this Maidan. And, and there were some regional Maidans also in other cities that uh, parliament, Ukrainian parliament, uh, the High Rada, Verkhovna Rada, uh, the Yanukovych uh, deputies, so the MPs, they succeeded to approve several laws which de facto cancelled the democratic regime in, in Ukraine. It touched the political uh, development of political system, uh, activities of political parties, uh, uh, implementation of some human rights, civil liberties. So, uh, 
and this this laws evidently uh, were approved with the uh, manipulation and even even uh, at that time it was the phrase that all these laws they are handy laws so it means that the uh, the procedure of voting was just by hand so it means that the counting of the votes was manipulated and when it was clear that Maidan is becoming more and more relevant for the situation in the country and more and more people somehow uh, joined this side of, of public events, then Yanukovych, so Yanukovych administration made a decision that uh, Maidan should be, should be somehow removed because uh, he felt that, uh, that this situation is threatening his uh, power position. Of course, there were, uh, there were pressures from Russia. Uh, there were evidences that some groups of Russian so-called siloviks, so people involved in military intelligence and other kinds of activities came to Ukraine, instructed Ukrainian representatives, so loyalists of Yanukovych regime. And at the end, this famous, infamously known, I would say, uh, killing, this uh, shooting and killing happened just on Maidan Nezależności, so my, uh, the square of uh, independence. And uh, during the short period of time, simply Yanukovych left the country and Maidan using, by the way, what was very interesting, because when you are, maybe uh, when you are listening what uh, Russian propaganda at that time, or now, was speaking and now still speaks that it was illegal coup d'etat, that Maidan was illegal coup d'etat. I mean, first, of course, uh, it's nonsense because it was the will of the millions of people. But second, people from Maidan, they didn't invade parliament. They didn't invade government, no. Uh, the whole procedures, according to the constitution, were absolutely 100% uh, followed, abided. Yeah. So the president was nominated on the base of the fact that the, uh, the uh, president in office left the country and s simply doesn't uh, fulfill the obligations. New government was appointed uh, with the majority voting in the parliament. So all these processes was, were absolutely, and it was a miracle. It was a miracle that uh, from one side, it's a revolution in the streets, but it, it's not, it wasn't the so-called as a Russian ideologist during the communism was speaking about a uh, great October socialist revolution, that it was revolutionary творчество, yeah, that it was a revolutionary kind of creating of new reality. No, it was law abiding process. And then in May, uh, the new president uh, was, in, uh, was uh, elected and Ukraine became, uh, Ukraine was continuing to exist as an independent state, which is observing all procedural uh, rules, all uh, norms, and, and uh, de facto was still a functional state. What I missed, of course, to, to tell you uh, that in February after Yanukovych uh, uh, left the country and Maidan won, Russia used this moment and uh, invaded, Russian troops invaded Crimea, in which, by the way, Russia had its own military bases. And the city Sevastopol was under uh, the administration of Russia as a base, as a Navy base, a city with Navy base of Russian fleet. And uh, during the short period of time staged the referendum, mockery referendum, and annexed Crimea. So it was a shocking event, not only for Ukrainians. However, I have to say that, uh, and I have personal experience with some of my Ukrainian colleagues and friends, some of them years and years before it happened, uh, warned me that uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine is not excluded. So for me, it was the time something which I couldn't imagine. But there were people, some of them worked in, 
in the security sector and they one guy of course i i cannot mention his name but he told me really he's good expert on uh, security he told me that uh, in accordance with the program of cooperation between russia and ukraine in security areas some common activities kind of maneuvers not military but let's say in staff maneuvers uh, the Russian colleagues, after the official former, formal part of the event, in the evening, after good meal, good food, and, and with, after drinking wine and other alcoholic beverages, they somehow, they confessed, they admitted that, guys, be sure that we will be together with you for, I mean, for forever forever we know that you are trying to be independent you can try but our bonds are so strong that just but be quiet we know what to do yeah it was it was said to me by by this person in 2000 2010 2011 probably so for me it was i have to say also shocking i mean i I visited Ukraine many times. I was born in Russia. I was growing up, socializing in Russia. I, I, I think that I, that time knew and now I know Russian people. And for me, it was absolutely, I cannot imagine that it could be really war. And it happened. First, it was annexation of Crimea, in which I think also uh, West didn't somehow, didn't succeed to, to make the test. I know that Western countries discouraged Ukrainian leadership at that time to, to resist. It's true that the Ukrainian army was dysfunctional, that uh, many commanders, of, I mean, on the higher level of, of military, they were directly Russian agents, many of them, including ministries, they had Russian citizenship and they were de facto, they were fulfilling uh, orders from the Moscow, but nevertheless, there were people who, uh, who wanted to fight, especially after uh, the Russian units of Spetsnaz, uh, who were, it was a masquerade, of course, that they were just uh, voluntarily uh, coming people from the citizens of Russia, uh, very warmed. Uh, uh, worried with the uh, development of the situation in Ukraine, so they were just, and they they wanted to help the local uh, activist activists opponents of the regime. Of course, it, 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 it was mockery. I think that the interpretation simply wasn't true. There were units of Russian uh, GRU, Spetsnaz of GRU. They uh, conquered parts of Ukrainian territory. They started in Slavyansk and then. Gradually, they somehow broadened the area of uh, their operations. Russia started to send them weapons, uh, provided the whole logistics. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Ukrainian qualified people, the former, so former soldiers or uh, really volunteers created this volunteers, uh, battalions, and, and somehow Ukrainian military forces in, in that shape that uh, existed at the time, they succeeded to stop uh, pro-Russian uh, forces and with, with the Russian commanders, and, uh, and so stopped and started to somehow expel them. And two times Russia openly, Russian regular army openly entered Ukrainian territory. First, it was in Ilovaisk in, uh, in August, and then the second time in Debalsovo uh, in February 2015. Why I'm speaking about this? Because uh, since the time uh, this part of Ukrainian territory was uh, de facto taken from Ukraine, uh, the administ administration was imposed from Russia to this territory. Formally, these two republics uh, these territories are two people's republic, but of course it's just uh, uh, the territories which are completely, uh, I'm repeating, completely ruled by Russia in security uh, sector, 
politically, economically, they are completely dependent on Russia. Now Russia is distributing Russian passports, Russian citizenship to uh, those inhabitants of uh, these regions who would accept the citizenship. Allegedly, up to 6,000 of people did this. I'm not surprised. It's not only about the willingness to be part of Russia, but simply these people are locked. They are in the trap because they live in the situation which is not uh, formally, it's not a a part of the territory of Russia, it's still territory of Ukraine, but Ukraine didn't, uh, doesn't control this territory, so cannot fulfill all, all needs of these people. Uh, and um, up to one million and a half, there are some estimates that two million people left this territories, these parts of Lugansk and Donetsk Oblast in Ukraine. Some, some of them uh, left to Russia, but bigger part to, to other regions of Ukraine. So the situation is really bad. And since that time, the situation is worsening, worse, worsening, worsening, and worsening. So this Minsk agreement, so-called Minsk agreement, which uh, were concluded after Russian invasion in the Baltsevo, with the uh, involvement of President François Hollande of France and uh, Angela Merkel, Merkel uh, Chancellor of Germany. But that time, only one thing really which worked. Since that time, nothing, nothing is working in this Minsk agreement. Uh, but that time, it uh, somehow stopped the bloodshed, stopped the killing of people, stopped the real fighting. But since that time, it's, according to a, a military scholars, military experts, it's a military conflict of lower intensity, but nevertheless, every year, dozens up to 100, up to 100 people are dying in this conflict from Ukrainian side. We, uh, we don't know numbers from the Russian or pro-Russian side. And by the way, since the time, the total number of uh, the killed people in Ukraine is uh, around or maybe more than uh, 15,000. So 15,000 of Ukrainian citizens were killed, mostly in the first two years of the conflict. Uh, it's a combination, of course, of civil uh, civilians and and the military, so soldiers, uh, troops. So 15 people became uh, victims of this aggression. So in this situation, I think it's very important to simply recognize the facts, because now we will be speaking about this absolute Russian ultimatums and context of these ultimatums. And it's very important how uh, West is reacting to this. I, I think that today West is much better reacting. But simply to recognize and to repeat the facts, it was Russia who invaded, attacked, invaded Ukraine. It was not Ukraine invaded Russia. It was Russia who annexed the part of Ukrainian territory, not Ukraine which uh, annexed Russian territory. Just Russia annexed the sovereign territory of Ukraine. It's Russia, which is today uh, concentrating military forces, evidently wanting to do something with Ukraine. Now we can discuss, I mean, what the whole game is about. But it's not Ukraine, which is amassing its troops on the borders with Russia, threatening Russia to uh, invade it. It's not Ukraine, but Russia, who is speaking that Ukraine is not the state. I mean, Vladimir Putin is writing articles, essays, in which he he says that uh, Ukrainians and Russians is the same nation. So de facto, Ukrainian nation doesn't exist. That Ukraine is a part of uh, the historic Russia, which should be restored. So we see how asymmetrical is this situation. So it's not Ukraine which is trying to prevent, let's say, any international partners, which which Russia is concluding with other states, but it's Russia which is trying to prevent Ukraine to be a member of the European Union, to be a member of NATO. I mean, can you imagine that Ukraine should demand from Russia not to cooperate, let's say, with I don't know, with Iran, or maybe North Korea, or maybe some other countries, because Ukraine Ukraine feels that it's not in favor of Ukrainian state. It would, I mean, it's nonsense. 
but vice versa now we see how vice russia is speaking openly about this even presenting these demands to international community and international community has to deal with this negotiating about this i mean uh, discussing inside then preparing some responses either oral or now even a written response so we see the situation in which one country nuclear power big state which has as at least the leaders of this state are declaring has the global interest is behaving in international arena in completely different manner than other normal states it's annexing invading threatening presenting demands to other organizations for example to nato to return in the year one uh, uh, 1997 to change the organization of nato to withdraw troops from nato states Slovakia is a NATO state, we have our own troops on our territory. How can we, and, and, and I mean, where we can, <laughs> we can withdraw our, our troops. So, and, so it's a constant permanent process of completely different behavior of Russia. Now, what is about the whole this so-called crisis with Ukraine? I don't think that it's crisis. I mean, it's clear cut situation of the aggressive intentions of one state against another state and using this state as a pretext for doing something with the, in other countries. Because in these last ultim, uh, two ultimatums, absolutely absolute ultimatums, the issue of Ukraine is somehow connected, incorporated in the bigger uh, area of relations between Russia and the West. So what would be deal? And what really happened is now I will present just my personal opinion. Personal opinion from following the situation, analyzing the statements, analyzing the steps of uh, actors involved in this, because today it's not only about Russia and Ukraine, the whole NATO is involved now. United States involved some specific countries like uh, France and Germany with the special relations to this conflict also are involved in this, Turkey, Today, uh, Turkish President Erdogan is in Kiev, so he's visiting Kiev. And, and the topic of Erdogan uh, visit in Kiev is Ukraine-Russia relations. I mean, to think about this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that Turkey will deal with Russian-Ukrainian conflict. I mean, that time it, it would, I mean, look like nonsense. But today is reality. So now I, I will present very shortly, very shortly I will present my understanding of the situation and maybe I don't know how much time I have. Oh, sorry, I, I over exceeded, but. Yeah, we should, we should try to, uh, to leave some time for the question, but go ahead, uh, uh, conclude Dr. Mesejnikov. Well. Looks like the, the things get frozen. Um, so just uh, while we waiting for uh, him to, uh, I guess, reconnect, I will just remind all of you that NATO is a military alliance of the countries which subscribe to democracy and to the rule of law. So we are the leading country among the NATO members, um, uh, and uh, uh, but uh, NATO involves also uh, uh, 28 other countries, Canada, such as Canada, Spain, and various countries around the Europe, including Turkey. And so the, uh, the, the tension is, uh, is uh, brewing among other things where the NATO countries or NATO alliance is also part of this um, uh, now conversations because um, this type of uh, behavior, aggression, aggressive behavior of Russia is not only endangering um, Ukraine, but perhaps endangering other countries, the neighboring countries to Ukraine or other countries that are essentially 
surrounding the Black Sea, such as Turkey. And in that way, uh, uh, NATO, important NATO countries are becoming essentially um, under potential threat. And so therefore it will pull the whole NATO alliance into the problem. And, uh, um, and that is where the tension stands right now. Essentially, how should NATO act to uh, essentially allow, um, allow the state of Ukraine to continue on its path as Dr. Mesejniko established on its path toward more stabilizing yeah. democracy and improvement of the rule of law? Or should NATO just observe and not be involved? And so now we have Dr. Mesejniko, please. Uh, Yes, thank you very much. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry, but something happened to my router. Sometimes, sometimes it happens. Unfortunately, it's a Huawei router. Yeah, if you can uh, just turn the camera on. Uh, okay, there you are. Yes, yes. Can you can you hear and see me now? Yes, yes, we do. Yes. So, and now it's my my final part of the presentation with uh, my. My interpretation of the of the events. So everything started with a massive concentration of military troops, Russian military troops, uh, around Ukrainian border. So in the territories in, uh, in immediate vicinity, with these two two parts of the Ukrainian territory, formerly not annexed but de facto occupied, from Crimea, from the south. Uh, still the time not from the Belarus, but it was clear that it, it was very unusual. So uh, around 100,000 troops, some of them were transferred from the Far East. Mostly these were military units with the offensive weapons. So tanks, armored vehicles, cannons, uh, missile launchers and all this stuff. So it's so everything was and still is usable in uh, the direct combat. The process lasted a couple of weeks. It was very disturbing, very worrying. And uh, the Russian propaganda, so the TV channels, they were sending signals and signals about bad situation in Ukraine, that Ukraine is not delivering, that Ukraine is not fulfilling Minsk agreement, that Ukraine government is illegitimate. So the very massive propaganda against Ukraine, which indicated, I think, that pre preparation for something bad for Ukraine. Now, uh, I think that the Kremlin uh, leadership is quite aware about the consequences of any Russian steps in against Ukraine. But at the same time, it knows that the Western community is not speaking by one, one voice, that sanctions are not enough strong, that uh, West is quite slow. It looks like that Western, uh, that West is weak. Uh, and I think according to some I don't know, maybe not the full knowledge, because unfortunately we don't know. I mean, uh, the Russian uh, foreign policy, the creation of Russian foreign policy is so non-transparent that we can just think about something, but uh, it has some logic. And now I'm presenting my logic. That uh, Russia or Putin wanted to find some pretext for let's say military operations against Ukraine. We can guess, I mean, what kind of military operation, what would be the scale, but he needed some pretext. And uh, in the previous years, he used pre pretext inside the Ukraine itself. But I think that uh, probably he considered now the situation is from his point of view, more adventurable if the pretext will be found not in Ukraine, but in the West. And then he presented this absurd ultimatum. It was clear for everybody that this ultimatum cannot be satisfied, cannot be accepted. And of course, 
Putin is he's not foolish. I, I, I mean, we can we can have different opinions about him, about his let's say, mental state, about some of his crazy ideas about Russian history, Ukrainian history, relations, about relations between the West and Russia, what happened to Soviet Union, very strange ideas, very, I would say, fuzzy, very obscure, and some very dangerous, but he is not completely full. So he, I think that he had to know that West couldn't accept this ultimatum. And then I am now elaborating the possible way of this thinking. When West simply will not accept this, then it will be for me pretext. You don't want to provide us good conditions for security. You are not promising us to prevent any Ukrainian movement to NATO. You simply neglect us. Ukraine is your puppet. Ukraine created this problem with Ukraine. Our security guarantee in this kind of relationship are not possible. And it's my obligation to provide this uh, security guarantees. Moreover, I am defender of the interest of Russian-speaking pe uh, people in Ukraine, but the whole population. Because Ukrainians, they are still, they are us. We and Ukrainians, we are the same nation. But something happened I think what he didn't expect, that first, West was qu relatively quick, quite quick. West was clear. West was strong in response. And he didn't probably expect this, but still it was kind it still, even with this strong position, uh, Putin still had opportunity to use this as a pretext. But another thing, Two things what happened, which I think discourage him from invading Ukraine. First, some Western countries finally started to send weapons to Ukraine and very efficient weapons, not trivial weapons. I mean, uh, anti-tank missiles, these two systems, Javelin from the United States and NLAW from Britain, it's Swedish system, and then the modernized version of Stinger. And I think it played a, a role of game changer in security area and in political area. What he probably didn't expect that now West was very strong, clear and, and uh, quick in promising the real, now real sanctions, not the sanctions which were very selective, inefficient, but sanctions which really, I think, have a potential to harm the state, the current Russian state, and which would introduce quickly, immediately. Uh, definitely you know that uh, Senator Menendez now is proposing even the variant of sanctions before the invasion, possible invasion. So, but it's, it's maybe for, for another special discussion. So these two things, I think, Discourage people, uh, discourage Putin uh, from immediate invasion, and I think that now he's hesitating. He's now hesitating. I think that still, I mean, the escalation is not happening. It's not any this is the, uh, this is the escalation of the territory, of the border territory. Moreover, Russia sent thirty thousand troops to Belarus. Never in Belarusian history, never Belarus became independent state also in 1992, such big number of Russian troops uh, was uh, installed or uh, present on the territory of Belarus. 30,000 troops. It's not, for, <laughs> it's not for defense of Belarus because nobody uh, really, nobody is threatened in Belarus, but it, I think it's for one purpose. In case of military operation, the conflict between uh, Russia, not even if not even conflict between Ukraine and Russia, it will be aggression of Russia against Ukraine. Then Kyiv is very close from uh, the northern uh, border of Ukraine with Belarus, and then the probability of invasion to Kyiv is becoming, becoming yeah, now as we see uh, from the north. So the escalation is not happening. Uh, Putin is still, I think, he is considering different options. So my point is that thanks to 
Western very quick and efficient response, especially in providing Ukrainians this kind of very sophisticated and very efficient, all these, I mean, anti tank missiles, they have 100% efficiency, 100%. So it means that if Ukraine now has, I think, maybe 3,000 javelins and NLEAW, it means that 3,000 uh, tanks are in advance dead. And, and the stingers, the stingers, they are in, in Afghan, I think in Afghan war, uh, the efficiency of that time, not modified, uh, modernized uh, stingers was in hands of uh, Afghan Mujahideen's uh, 70%, 70%. So I think that uh, no less efficiency can be expected in Ukraine. So, uh, and my, so my concluding point is that now Vladimir Putin has got something which he probably didn't want to get from the West. His intentions are still the same as at the beginning. He doesn't recognize Ukraine as a state in 2014. He wanted to uh, conquer at least part, part of Ukrainian territory, the, the eastern and part of the southern part of Ukrainian territory. It was officially declared that it will be the state with the name Novorossiya, so new Russia, and of course, it will be the fake state maybe during the short period of time and then definitely it will be annexed by Russia. Fortunately, it didn't happen thanks to real heroism of Ukrainian fighters and Ukrainian people, Ukrainian civil society, by the way, because many people from civil society organizations, just well-organized, socially well-organized people really defended uh, and, 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 def and de facto saved the Ukraine state, Ukrainian democratic statehood they saved from this aggression so we, we have to be very careful i'm speaking about position of those who are working for let's say the governments of uh, western countries uh in i think in this in this confrontation definitely the right side is ukraine and the wrong side of russia it's absolutely clear by the way many russian intellectuals are now signing petition against the war unfortunately the situation for Democratically thinking, uh, people in Russia is quite bad. They do not have opportunity to rally. They are persecuted. So I think that what these famous Russian intellectuals say today, I heard that 3,000 people already signed this petition against aggressive and criminal war against Ukraine from, uh, from Russia. And I think that it's also kind of heroic deeds I mean, to be so in, no in line with official Russian foreign policy, it's really, it's, it's remarkable what these people are, they are risking, they are risking, maybe sometimes if they are less known in society, they are risking even their lives. So maybe in this point, I, I'm finishing and now I'm ready for answer the questions. Excellent. All right. So, um, um, people, uh, you can now come up with your questions. And while uh, you're getting ready to ask Dr. Mesejniko a question, um, I will kind of use the opportunity because I can, right? Uh, to <laughs> yes. ask the first question or rather maybe two questions. First, um, so you are suggesting that what is happening now there is a bluff that Putin played and then he get out of his hands. But can he go back from it? Because now things are quite, how you say quite advanced and uh, if he backs away from this now it will be perceived as a weakness and he is not necessarily happy to look weak and then second or other really important part of the question and it's also in the title is okay why should we you remember we are, we are americans and we are americans we are primarily pragmatic people right why should we care about this why should we be concerned i mean you know, what is in it for us? Uh, and, uh, you know, why do you think we should be involved? Why do you think we should be uh, essentially being so closely monitoring and and being so involved that to the point that we are becoming nervous, are we gonna go into confrontation with Russia or not? Or, so tell us that dimension. First, you know, is it too far? Can the, what do you think? Can Putin kind of back away from this tension that, he essentially misplayed, according to what you said. 
And the second, what is in it for us Americans? Well, there's uh, two excellent questions. And uh, both for longer elaboration, I will be I will be trying to be as short as possible to have some space for other questions, but really excellent questions. Look, now what we are uh, what we are witnessing, it looks maybe as a bluff, but it initially I think that it wasn't invented as a bluff. It was invented for real something. I mean, something would be made against Ukraine. I don't know, really, I don't know how how massive this operation would be. I mean, it can be just, I was, a uh, couple of days ago, I was uh, discussing with, uh, in Vienna, I, I was on one conference and I was discussing with them, one excellent Romanian uh, security analyst, and according to her, it was just a game about, uh, about this too smaller part of Ukrainian territories. But my point, I, I disagree with this because I mean, Russia Russia has these two smaller parts of Ukrainian territory. I mean, this Donetsk and Lugansk region, part of them. And it has eight years. So you wouldn't need to, to build up troops in so in so big numbers. You can just you can just announce yes from this from this uh, moment the people in these areas decided to be part of the Russian territory. I mean, we know how they are manipulating all these processes. They would probably conduct the fake referendum and, and then, I mean, they will just annex this territory without any military operation. So it means that I don't think that the game was uh, about these two small pieces of territory. Then uh, maybe there were some considerations that probably they wanted to broaden the territory which they would control at least to Mariupol. To Mariupol is uh, in Azov's, uh, Azov Sea, it's very important part of Ukrainian territory because they have port. They have port there, and through this port, uh, very uh, important Ukrainian. Well, it looks like. Um, Dr. Mesejniko got kicked out again. Um, and so I, as I have uh, uh, shared the screen and I showed you where the Mariupol is, it's right there on the coast of Black Sea. And uh, um, if you look at the map of Russia, that Black Sea is extremely important for uh, um, for Russian ability to essentially project its um, military and um, commercial power across the world because it, it has a warm water ports. Uh, those uh, other ports that Russia has in the far north and in the far east are frozen most of the year. So uh, when they are to essentially um, enter into whatever oceans they have to use these warm water ports and as you see all these other parts up um, in the north that Russia has access to sea is is essentially frozen six times of the year uh, six months of the year and then so the only real access to the uh, oceans is through these warm water ports which are essentially in in um, um, in the Black Sea. So when uh, Dr. Mesejnikov spoke about Mariupol, right, he was talking about the importance of that port for Russia. Um, and uh, as you know, this shows in here. So now also uh, while he's connecting, he's gonna be back in shortly. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please um, either raise your hand or type in, I see, um, uh, I see two questions from Linda and Edwin. And uh, as soon as he joins us back, we're going to essentially uh, ask him those questions. Uh, he should though, uh, probably try to tell us also why does this matter to United States? So Dr. Mesejnikov, you just need to turn on your microphone, right? And so uh, let's try to be a little more effective because we are to finish uh, soon. So turn on the microphone. You are uh, still muted. 
And, um, yes, I'm very sorry. I really I regret very much that it happens, these technical problems. I, it's not very usual, but I don't know what is the reason. Okay, so finish the answer to the, your first question. And then now what to do from the point of view of Putin in this situation? Really, he is now in a very unfavorable, unfavorable situation for him. Uh, so it means that, I mean, and simply it's uh, taking into consideration the whole perception of him in Russian society, his mentality. I think that he couldn't simply decide to withdraw these troops. And I think that he will do something. Maybe it will not be the full-scale operation, but we have to be very careful. Still, the, uh, this option still exists. I, I cannot believe that it will be just ended with the kind of, even it's not even reconciliation because he escalated the, uh, the situation and now he is not capable to de-escalate in the way which can be acceptable for him. From not only from domestic, not only from domestic point of view, but also from international point of view, because he considered West as a weak, and now West can simply perceive him as an incapable politician. So it's just hypothesis, maybe. Now, second question, very, very good question, because I think that if Putin would succeed, then. I don't want to say the hegemony of the United States. I do, I do not like this, I mean, the whole this concept, concept of hegemony. But the fact is that the United States is today only one actor which is capable to provide framework for the just, stable, liberal order in international relations. Of course, with its partners, with its allies. And, and fortunately now this situation paradoxically with all these negative connotations helped western society to be more united and more cooperative even taking into consideration some discrepancies especially germany's position but still germany also joined these promises to impose the harshest possible sanctions so for the united states it's very important from this point of view united states is on the side first of uh, its allies. United States has the obligation. The United States is very important for, from the point of view of stability in Europe. It's, I think, it's something which maybe is quite trans transcendental. It's destiny of the United States, but it's not, not only because of this. I mean, we live in the democratic free society, as the United States is. Uh, but we have now on the table the case of Russia, the case of China, other authoritarian states, which in case, if Russia would succeed with Ukraine, then I think that Russia will not stop only with Ukraine. And now, now I'm not speaking about China because it's a special issue, just maybe a couple of sentence about, sentences about one concept of, now he is American historian, but he is Russian and he lives in the United States, he's quite, known in in russia i think that he be, belongs to the best five modern historians in russia his name is yuri felstinsky maybe some of our viewers uh, heard this name he is historian dealing with the second world war and with the history of uh, soviet secret services in, now he published a book which was released in russian language published in Kiev, it's a big book really, maybe six, five, six hundred pages, and he came with a concept which uh, is speaking this. It's the first time in human history when it, any state, but especially the nuclear power, the power, political power was grabbed or was taken, not by political party, any group, military, any group of interest, but completely by secret service. And the state is behaving as a state which is ruled by secret service domestically, so consolidation of authoritarian regime, repressions, killing, kidnapping people, uh, disappearance of people, and so on, and very aggressively on the international scene. And his point is that unless Vladimir Putin 
is the president of Russia. The whole case of Ukraine is used and will be used as a, maybe not bargaining chip, but some element, element of relations between Russia and, and the West. According to him, uh, the, uh, the Third World War, of course, it's not the full war, but uh, was started in Ukraine in 2014. And uh, Putin is still thinking about confrontation of the West. It looks for us as a, inimaginable. I mean, Russia is nuclear power. The West is also quite well equipped with the nuclear power, nuclear uh, weapons. And uh, what we can expect from this kind of confrontation is the mutual uh, extermination. But there are some voices in Russian political and especially military uh, establishment which are admitting the nuclear war of low intensity, so using the tactical nuclear weapons in the limited territory. For example, in Europe, and there are different scenarios. I don't want now to, I mean, to divert our uh, attention to this kind of considerations, but according to him, and I'm tending to agree with him, maybe his prediction is too dark, that uh, it's very, very probable that if the behavior of Vladimir Putin will not change, and I think that it really will not change, then the probability of uh, much more, I would say, white confrontation than only confrontation with Ukraine or around Ukraine can be probable. All right, so Dr. Meshezhikov, let's let's have like a little bit more uh, uh, a concise answer so that we can address all the questions. There are a lot of questions coming. So for example, one of the, and as I said, anybody wants to turn on the microphone and ask the question directly, people, please join us. Dennis. Um, uh, yes, ahead. Professor. What kind of support does Putin have with the Russian people right now? What kind of uh, losses would they be willing to accept for Ukraine and for his plans in the future? Thanks. Yeah, uh, well, it's a good question, but uh, I mean, my answer is uh, a bit uh, intuitional because, of course, there are some uh, opinion polls which are showing uh, the level of support. Uh, there are different agencies. Uh, Levada Center is the best, but uh, it's a problem in unfree society to believe even the very <coughs> quality, non-manipulated uh, uh, polls in which, in the country in which you cannot even go to, I mean, not only to rally, but just to stay with one slogans in the street, so-called picket, that somebody is calling you and asking you about support of the president. I mean, what can you expect from the, from this respondent, from this respondent? So many people are just agreeing with, I mean, this is support. Some are rejecting to answer. Of course, it changes the whole, the whole proportion, but, but on, on the level of intuition, I think that, I mean, su paradoxically, support for Putin in international relations is higher than his support in domestic issues. People are dissatisfied and disappointed with the social conditions, with the treatment of how the government is treating COVID. But uh, speaking about international, international affairs, people attending big part of Russian population under the influence of uh, state propaganda. I mean, they inherited this Soviet, Soviet interpretation of the Russian history. They, they are tending to support uh, for us, these are aggressive steps, but for them, it's something which is recollecting of the territories. So I think that in case of this confrontation with Ukraine, still reliable majority, I would say, on the side of Putin. It's definitely more than 50%, maybe 70%. But again, it's very difficult in such, in such situation, I mean, to really to know the real opinion poll. Uh, dynamics concerning the second part of your questions. I mean, what uh, losses can be accepted? Well, first, uh, Russia, Russian state Duma, 
a couple of years ago, adopted the special law, which enables government not to publicize the information about losses. So Russia is a big country. So it means that it's uh, somehow, it's a preventive measure, how not to inform the population about losses. But of course, the information today, I mean, internet, social networks, and all this stuff, I think that it's not possible to, to hide the information. But I heard from, from uh, some kind of, I read this, uh, non-identified sources from the West, which had a meeting with uh, their Russian counter partners, and they were informally debating, I mean, what number of the killed soldiers can be kind of acceptable, or I mean, what, what is the highest level, highest level? And allegedly, according to non-identified unnamed sources, it's 60,000 soldiers, which is it's a huge, it's a huge mass. So it means that this regime is capable to accept big numbers, maybe not really 60,000. 60,000 is, I mean, it's something unbelievable. But, but when we are following the policies of this state, I mean, this state is not very careful about lives of people. So I think that uh, this level is much, much higher than the level of acceptance of, let's say, victims of the war in the West. From this point of view, of course, Putin is much better prepared for, for real confrontation with the West. Ukrainians are different. Ukrainians, according to uh, currently uh, publicized opinion poll in Ukraine, and I completely uh, trust the Ukrainian polls, not only because I have among my friends good posters in Kiev, but I know that, I mean, the conditions for free expressing opinion in, in, in polls is absolutely 100% provided. And according to, to the last opinion poll, 61% of Ukrainian population would support military resistance and uh, can and admit their personal in, uh, participation in this resistance. So it's, they're very motivated. So it's that means that- The situation means... in the West, not the situation. We are peacers from this point of view. Yeah, so that means we cannot accept really that that internal Russian, how you say, dynamics and pressure on their government will prevent the war. In other words, there is nothing in the Russia that can prevent the war. So the only thing, according to what Dr. Mesejiko is saying, is unified, you know, Western response with the threat of, you know, essentially sanctions and uh, all other things, tools that the West has in order to make Russia not uh, act. But one of the students is asking, all right, so then what will be the cost of those sanctions? That, what will be the effect of the or cost of those sanctions that United States will have to bear with? So you spoke about the cost of Russia, you spoke about cost of Ukraine, but you know, uh, even in my question, I don't think you really touched upon our hearts in America and convinced us that we should be involved. Like the whole world is calling America come help us, come help us. And if we start doing that, you know, we just have a bridge collapsed in Pennsylvania, right? We are also busy. We have to somewhat dedicate some efforts here. So why, and you know, what do you think? What will be the effect on the United States? Okay, I would start from the second part of your question that I, I wasn't enough convincing. Of course, I mean, uh, I was speaking about values, about something which is about obligations of a lie of the United States. But I think that, I mean, the general, there are some interests, of course, interests of United States and Europe. I mean, the Europe is the best possible partner for United States in many issues, economic cooperation. I mean, in many issues. So you can rely more on Europe than any other big other states or entities, international organizations. Uh, I know that uh, there are some critical I mean, stances of some Americans about Europe, and I have to say that many times I, many times I share these views, and I understand why Americans are sometimes nervous when European allies uh, are not delivering. Yeah, but nevertheless, we are the closest. Really, we are the closest. And uh, I mean, always when a situation in Europe was good, stable, it was in favor of United States. But again. You shouldn't underestimate 
and it has practical consequences. You shouldn't estimate, uh, underestimate the possibility of rising the authoritarian powers which are aggressive against you also. It's, it, as I said, it's not only about Ukraine. It's about the West as such, Europe, of course, because Europe is the next. After you, if Ukraine, I mean, God forbid, but if Ukraine will be conquered by Russia, we are, we are the next. I mean, I'm, I'm now sitting in this, in this very comfortable place. Just, uh, uh, I will tell you, uh, Two thousand thirty-two miles to the border with Ukraine, in Bratislava, the most western located city in Bratislava is just two thousand thirty-two miles to border with Ukraine, and we know what Russian tanks are about in this country. So they came more than fifty years ago, and only after the collapse of communism. So it's a kind of rule that unless Russian troops are on the territory which they conquered, almost nothing would uh, expel them. Okay, so and the first, now the, the price of these uh, sanctions to Russia and to the West. Of course, it will be price for both sides, but much better, it will be much more costly for Russia, of course. So uh, I think that the West, United States, Europe, Europe is more in more risky situation here because this interconnection and, and mutual dependence is higher. Uh, Russia and Europe than Russia and United States. But of course, it, it, it will be some cost for us. But I mean, sometimes the situation require, requires to do some costly thing in order to prevent disastrous, disast disastrous development. I don't know exactly the numbers. I know that the sanctions which were imposed, by the way, in very wrong sequences, but it's for other discussion by European Union and United States, they are har harmful, but they are not critically harmful against the Russian economy, and especially against those who are surrounding Putin. Putin is, of course, he is the main player, but he is not in the vacuum. So it means that people who are close to Putin, I think that also they can at least do something, do something to prevent the worst. And now I know that uh, Great Britain is preparing the personal sanctions with the financial consequences against several hundreds of Russian oligarchs and their family members who either live in London or, I mean, saving money there in the banks somehow and they are visiting London and so on. So uh, cost will, I think that this kind of sanctions, which uh, the West pronounced during these two, three weeks, I think that they will be very costly for, for Russia. Uh, what are, I mean, uh, what, what is about the sanctions? It's about uh, cancellation of Russian connections to sweet, complete embargo to uh, Russian energy supplies, uh, prohibition of uh, export of technologies, not only military technologies or double technologies, but uh, but many te modern technologies which are critically important for functioning of Russian infrastructure, for example, computer technique and all this stuff. So it means that now I think now it's really serious. But I cannot I cannot give you the numbers. Okay, so essentially, you know, the idea is if we do not intervene now, the intervening later will be even more expensive. So exactly, exactly, so, you know, exactly. because Russia was talking about coming back to Cuba, basically going to Venezuela, which at that point, you know, they're right there, and then things become serious. I have two more questions. Both of them are very good, <coughs> slightly different slightly different, but they're good. The first one is, again, the same based on this, do you believe that the international community responds to annexation of Crimea, essentially imp empowered Russia to do what it now is doing? And do you believe that, or rather, what do you think, what else could have been done at that point? And now there's another excellent question that a person, the student is asking, do you know how much of a Ukraine's territory 
Russia's air defense covers? You know, is there any parts of Ukraine that Russia air defense does not cover? And I, even I know the answer, it's no, but I will let Dr. Mesezhnikov talk about it. Well, excellent, both excellent questions. First question about, uh, sorry, about Crimea, yeah. Well, uh, it was new situation, and I understand the Western uh, governments, they have very, I mean, all Western, especially in Europe, these democratically elected governments, they are afraid of any military conflicts because it's peaceful situation in Europe. I mean, we, with the exception, of course, of Balkan state, Balkan, yeah, the former Yugoslavia, which was big disaster for, for Europe and somehow it was uh, solved, not finally, but uh, with, with certain kind of coexistence stability, but still, I mean, today's situation in Bosnia, I think it's uh, also very risky, but, but uh, speaking about big war, really the full scale war with involvement of dozens of states, it's not a case in Europe since the end of the Second World War. I'm now not speaking about this uh, limited military operations, invasion of uh, Soviet Union to Hungary, it was more bloody and, and then in Czechoslovakia, but I mean, and now something happened like this that foreign troops came and annexed the territory. And I know that uh, that some key uh, Western politicians, I would say, encouraged Ukrainian government not to resist, not to take any military actions, not to combat. Uh, that time it was understandable, but I think that it wasn't it wasn't very right. I mean, advice. The second thing, which, and I have to say that from this point of view, I mean, it's paradoxical situation when sometimes bad things happen, and then, I mean, uh, it's a confirmation of your rightness that you you predicted and you 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 saw the situation better than others. From the beginning, I was saying, and it, you can even find in some of Ukrainian media outlets my statements about this, that the whole sequence which uh, the West countries applied uh, in issue of sanctions against Russia was bad. That again, that time probably it was understandable because no one, nobody knew the time, you know, what will be the development of the situation, and Putin was lying. I mean, Putin wasn't speaking about annexation. I mean, they, they uh, organized the referendum and there were some thoughts that probably it will be maybe the second Abkhazia, not fully uh, annexed by Russia. So referendum about state independence of Crimea. So all these things, I think that it, it, it helped Putin to do what he really did. So, uh, but the annexation was the worst what happened during this war absolutely the worst. All other things were all also bad, but they, the evil character was lower than annexation. The annexation is absolutely unacceptable. I mean, it was simply grabbed territory. So my idea at that time was that the West should introduce the most possible that time sanctions forever. And then to somehow changing to softening the sanctions only if Russians would do something in a positive way. But the, the segment was different. The segment was, and still is valid, that uh, some sanctions were introduced. Then every uh, six months, European Union is deciding whether to prolong them or not. Fortunately, they were prolonged many, many times. Every, so it means that 16 times it was prolonged. prolonged. But the, uh, the better, and they are not, I mean, they, they were adding something after this MH17 MH, uh, case, there were other sanctions, then some other sanctions, but still, I think that these sanctions, they were not very systematic. The, the, the strongest possible sanctions in the beginning, and then conditioning the cancellation, gradual cancellations, cancellation of these sanctions only as a result of Russian deliverance in their occupation, their escalation, and so on. So it's my it's my 
uh, answer to uh, to your first question of our what could have been done. Yes. Now the question about the air defense. How, air defense. how much of the of uh, uh, Russian air defense? Uh, how much uh, Ukrainian territory covers Russian air defense? Well, of course, they are, I mean, first, Ukrainian territory is now covered by Ukrainian air defense, so maybe, uh, I don't know exactly whether the whole territory, but concerning Russia, Russia air defense, I'm not expert on this, but uh, I think that uh, they, if they, if they would start, they would definitely start with, uh, with uh, attacking from the air. There were some even I, not ideas, but but some considerations, some speculations that they will start with the removal or destruction of command units, uh, administrative centers, so they would somehow decapitate the state and military operations. But I don't know exactly. Unfortunately, I'm not a military expert in in such <laughs> in such areas. But you said that you know. I mean, how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it pretty much covers the entire territory, even even beyond beyond um, Ukraine. I mean, the covered air defense. So it means that uh, det detecting uh, the movement here yeah, in the territory. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. And also ability to essentially target any place in Ukraine, uh, you know, from its air defense um, um, air defense you know, systems. All right, so uh, we are now essentially um, uh, uh, to conclude, unless there's any other question. Um, yes, then it's, it's, it's right, yeah. Uh, unless there are any other questions, um, uh, people, uh, we are to conclude uh, to thank Dr. Mesejnikov for being with us. Um, and we hope Dr. Mesejnikov, you're gonna visit us sometimes in Florida, the weather is beautiful. <laughs> Hopefully not as a refugee, you know, running away from Russian invasion, <laughs> but as a guest of ours, right? Although um, it's not really a matter of joke, uh, it is certainly problematic, and it's I'm I'm sure people in Slovakia are very very concerned, uh, as well as in other parts of Europe. As you spoke, as you said it, you know, it's all over the news. Also the instability of Bosnia, it's closely tied to what happened in Ukraine. And we can also say that if, um, if Russia does not succeed uh, with very quick intervention in Ukraine, then we can expect the conflict to broaden, to kind of go into other places. So it's really, really important for, for all actors, including Western actors, according uh, um, you know, to essentially start getting involved now, because if the conflict spreads from Ukraine to other parts of Europe, then it will be inevitable for the United States to be involved, and it perhaps will be with with uh, much much worse um, consequences. So, thank you again, um, Dr. Mesejnikov. It was great opportunity for our students to hear an expert from Europe speaking about Europe. And in fact, expert from Eastern Europe speaking about Eastern Europe and essentially showing and explaining, you know, what certain moves that uh, military leaders make mean. And so now we will better, we'll be able to better understand the policies and conversations that our government here in the United States is making. It is all over the news and we wanna essentially better understand what is at stake. And when our president is talking about it, we want to understand why is it important. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mesejnikov. If you have anything to add to this, uh, this is the time. Yeah, just two things if I can. First, uh, I see, I feel how more and more Westerners, scholars, professionals, but, but also ordinary people finally I mean, not started, but realize, they realize with whom they are dealing, I mean, looking to, to the Moscow, to the Kremlin. I mean, it's really, it's not just the standard international actor, yes, with some authoritarian irregularities, but more or less normal, I mean, like we, so not, it's not a big deal. 
we can somehow handle with this. No, it's uh, it's not just uh, a bit different and strange authoritarian regime with very peculiar leader is a really aggressive power. And uh, I mean, we shouldn't put our uh, heads in the sand and we have to recognize the situation. And I feel that the situation uh, is changing with this. And the second thing is just technical. Thank you very much, Professor Kreshtaras, dear, my dear friend Mirsad, for your excellent technical support. I have to say that from time to time, I am, of course, using uh, PowerPoint presentations and, I mean, some, some pictures, but I have to say that never, never in my life, I had such excellently prepared presentations by myself. So you are so beautiful in this. I mean, it was brilliant. Yeah, I anticipated the things that you're going to say, and then I was preparing it right as we go. Um, thank you, thank you. It was a, quite a pleasure to have you. I again thank you very much. We also thank uh, Pro Professor Surova for actually arranging this. She is joining us also. She is part of the conversation. I don't know if she wants to stay step in. I have to tell you also that I had the support from people here at Brow College. My assistant dean Todd Bernhardt was very supportive of this. Even the provost, the provost of Rao College was uh, at some point joined us for the conversation. He was also quite interested and very happy and thankful that you are with us. And so it was quite, uh, quite good, a good experience for our students to have this international experience. And maybe in the future, we can maybe do something, Professor Svetlusha, maybe we can do something to bring a, a batch of Rao College students to Slovakia so that they can learn more about your beautiful country or maybe have some students from you come over to us. We'll see. But for now, um, thank you all and um, have a wonderful weekend. And uh, I'll see you, my students, I see you all on Monday. And the uh, rest of you, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much.